Thank you all for coming out. This is about the 114th day of Beyond Fest, the festival that never, ever stops. Uh, it's been amazing. We programmed the Devils. We were talking about it. We're like, will anybody come? And we're like, I don't know, but we'll watch it. And uh, we put it on sale, and then all you people were absolutely batshit. So thank you all for coming out. Um, we're a nonprofit. All proceeds from Beyond Fest go to the American Cinema Tech, which is also a nonprofit. So thank you for coming out. While we're gonna screen tonight, I can tell you this, it is a 35 millimeter print that only been screened twice in the United States. That's what I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Once in Oregon, once in Texas, and the third time in Los Angeles. <laughs> Shutter. Shutter, presenting sponsor. Yeah, gotta give a shout out to those guys. Uh, it is an awesome online streaming platform curated by horror fans for horror fans. Uh, if you sign up through one of the postcards outside, you'll get six weeks free. Um, they're great people, doing great things, we love them. That said, thank you for coming and supporting uh, this film in the theater tonight. Mm. Anything Spencer? else? Spencer? Tomorrow night, we've got the LA premiere of The Mai's Eye. I don't know who you can get out of the theater. It's a ridiculous, fucking mental splatter fest. It's got a store by Steve Moore. We've got an exclusive Steve Moore seven inch for the tomorrow to sell. And then we have I Speak Machine playing after as well. And an after party at the Hyperion Tavern with all the run food guys, which is gonna be fucking bananas. And Saturday, of course, we're sold out for Al Pacino and Dog Day Afternoon, but during that day we have Lon Chaney's grandson, Ron Chaney. Uh, coming down here, and we are doing the 1925 version of Family Opera um, before it was cut and changed, and uh, it has the original score that was played that night that uh, it played in Los Angeles, and it hasn't been played since then. So it'll be a piano and violin playing the score while Ron Chaney, Ron Chaney is telling me he's going to probably bring down uh, Lon Chaney's uh, Wolfman teeth, which is awesome. So there'll be some memorabilia out there. And you can all try them. Try the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see if that happens. All right. Uh, so Sunday, uh, tribute to Wes Craven, late Wes Craven. Robert England is going to be here along with all the masses of horror directors. Great. So now I'm going to bring out a special guest to introduce this. Uh, he's one of my favorite directors. He directed Paper House, which is a beautiful film that we just showed up 35. He did the Tolstoy trilogy with Ivan's Ecstasy, Candyman, Boxing Day. Many others. He was a friend of Uncle Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up to Bernard Rose. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to take a quick poll. Who here has not seen this film before? Wow. Well, actually, probably in the U.S., I don't think anybody has seen this version. I'm not supposed to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. Uh, but uh, I saw it. I remember uh, the first time I saw it was actually in 1973, and I was uh, probably too young for it. <laughs> I, I remember wandering into it in a cinema in, in Hendon, uh, in London, and uh, uh, sort of 111 minutes later coming out, and my entire view of the world was changed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a friend of mine asked me um, actually earlier if I thought it was kind of a, a shocking film and maybe it would g give them difficulty sleeping tonight. And I said, you'll be all right after about a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, this is a really, um, th this is, I would, you know, it's very hard to talk about favorite films, but this is definitely one of my favorite films. It might even be my favorite film. It is an unqualified masterpiece. It is, without question, the greatest film made by a very great director, who is sadly now no, no longer with us, Ken Russell. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Ken made this film unbelievably with 100% finance for Warner Brothers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, different time. Different time. I don't know. I can imagine the meeting. <laughs> Ken <Walsh. laughs> There were these nuns in 1634. <laughs> and they're possessed by the devil. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's um, it's very interesting. 
there was at the time it came out, it, it shocked people to the extent that they that they tried to dismiss it and they tried to disparage it as, as trash. Uh, it's it's clearly not trash. It clearly really gets under your skin in a really unpleasant way. And um, <laughs> Ken, it's not. I, I think it's also unfair to, to view it as um, as a blasphemous work. Though of course it contains a great deal of blasphemy in terms of the movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the point is, is that Ken himself was actually uh, he, he was he was a quite a religious Catholic in his own way, um, and. But he had obviously some issues with the church. <laughs> um, <laughs> the film, the film is based on a 1953, actually a very serious historical and scholarly work by Aldous Huxley, the same Aldous Huxley that wrote Brave New World. Um, but the book, The Devil of Devils of Ludan, which this film is very closely um, based on, and the play by John Whiting, which was an adaptation of the book. Um, but it's, it's all essentially comes from the Huxley, and Huxley's book is a serious historical work with a lot of kind of digressions in it about the nature, the true nature of spirituality and the kind of essential problems of mass hysteria and how that is like the great danger in a totalitarian state, is it how totalitarian states use mass hysteria to motivate the mob to kill who they regard as their enemies. And at the time the film came out, there was a very snide review, actually, by Roger Ebert, who, someone who I personally like very much and wrote, normally I really admire his writing, but he clearly got this film very wrong, or it got under his skin. But the, the whole gist of his very sarcastic review is that why would anyone be, why would anyone care about what went on in the 17th century in France? And I think the film, the film explains that in terms of its own actual conclusion. In the, it's, the film is about a man, Urban Grandier, the priest of this town, who is a very unsympathetic man. He's a very flawed man. He is unquestionably a sinner. He is a bad person. And yet, when the state comes to crush him, and boy do they come to crush him, using anything they can lay their hands on, the most ridiculous, absurd, magical, nonsensical thinking that we, of course, now, you know, maybe in the rational <coughs> 70s, people could more easily reject, but now, of course, in the world we live in, where people are constantly using religion as a kind of stick to beat people with and to destroy people, I think Kent's film, unfortunately, has become more relevant, not less relevant. And I think that's why, essentially, this full version of the film has essentially been suppressed for the last 40 years. Um, because they don't want you to know its message. Its message is, very simply, without giving away the story, that if you stand up to the state, yes, the state will crush you and it will destroy everything about you and scatter your ashes to the winds. But by standing up to them, in the end, you undermine the state by demonstrating its corruptness and its lack of validity and its lack of, um, of any kind of compassion. And that, in that sense, I think Kent's film is profoundly religious in that he contrasts the spiritual redemption of Grandier against the oppressive and violent perversion of religion that's foisted upon the nuns by the exorcists and the state. And he contrasts those two things and he, in the end what he says is that um, is that those people don't have our best interests at heart. Um, it's a very, very powerful message and it's a very relevant message. And obviously it is a film about martyrdom and as such I think one of the things that's extraordinary about Ken's work and most misunderstood about his work is that he began making a series of really very brilliant films about composers for the BBC in the 1960s, which, go and check them out on YouTube. He made films about Elgar and about Delius that are absolutely beautiful and wonderful. But he then, by the mid to late 60s, with his film about Delius and his film about Strauss, had, had started to get, grow tired of the idea of what, what I would call the well-made film. 
you know, the well-made film is the one where the costumes are all right, and where someone tells you they've done all this historical research and they know that people used to drink out of tankards that look like this, and all this kind of nonsense, because as anybody knows, there's nothing as stupid as an expert. So <laughs> no one knows what happened in the past. You know, we have very inaccurate and incomplete records of anything. So Ken had started in his historical films about composers and his documentary films, he started using Brechtian techniques. He started saying, I'm not going to pretend that we're in a real place. These are actors in costume. This is, this is a show. This is a pantomime. And he begins this movie in that way with a kind of five minute ballet to let you understand that naturalism has been sent home very soon in this film. <laughs> and I think a big part of that in this movie is the production design of Derek Jarman. Um, <laughs> I would argue this is the best production design film ever made. I mean, its decisions are so brilliant and so expressive. And they're influenced by two movies, basically. One of which is clearly Metropolis, which was Ken's favorite movie. Um, the white tiles and the, and the whole sort of futuristic nature of that. And the other one is uh, Carl Dreyer's um, Passion of Joan of Arc, which the film takes a lot from. And I think the idea of you know, Ken said that he got the idea for the sets from actually a, a line in the Huxley book, which was the exorcism of Sister Jeanne was like a rape in a public toilet. Um, by the way, it is in the film. Um, and so he built the sets like public toilets. That was his idea, that this, instead of it being a medieval town, he was going to make it out of kind of white ceramic tile. And it's, it's a kind of brilliant and eccentric decision that completely alters everything that you see in the film because suddenly we're not looking at people in some weird ancient world defending some ancient town that we don't care about. It's like they're in a modern city that's their city that's brand new, that's worth <laughs> fighting for and worth dying for. And that's the whole point, is to take it away from that idea of the well-made film. Uh, and, you know, nobody but Ken could have made this film. Uh, nobody but Ken would have wanted to, probably. But, um, it's, it, it is a masterpiece. It is actually a very serious film. It's also very funny. Um, don't, don't be embarrassed to laugh. It's hilarious and weird and campy and strange. But it's very, very serious and profound as well and ultimately very moving. And of course has incredible performances from Oliver Reed and uh, Vanessa Redgrave in the lead. Um, There isn't really much else I want to say about it, except that afterwards, there is still some bits that are missing from this print, some of which are important, and we may have some way of um, presenting some of that, but we'll see. Um, but I, all I want to say to you now is, you know, just watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and don't blame me if you don't sleep for a week.